so silly. Oh my gosh. And I gotta call my kids over. <laughs> Oh. So that's Samba, Nandi, and Penzi. Nandi's so big, I, I feel know, like. She's so big, look. It's like when you don't see so, like oh, a, a friend for a long time and you're like, you grew so much. <laughs> Penzi is behind her. Yeah, well, I mean, she's doubled in weight since, you know, her birth weight, so. Gosh. Uh, no, they can't see us just here, so we'll switch the camera if we have so we can actually start to uh, the camera. Let me get ice packs and all the hot spots. <clears throat> this morning, um, Zia, my daughter, was like, do you think that when Penzi was born, you could have held her? Like, would, like, how much did she weigh? Would you be strong enough to hold her? And I was like, no. No way. <laughs> yeah, it was almost 300 pounds, so it would have taken a few of us. <laughs> yeah, these mom muscles can't, can't lift that. <laughs> and so, there we go. And then we can switch back around to our view. Hi. Hi. There we go. Good morning. Y'all are a little bit quiet. Are you, are you near the mic? What's that? Can you hear us? We can hear you, but you're, you're, so, you're a little bit soft. Okay. Mm, let me see. I don't know what's going on with my microphone. Hang on. Let me just, uh, it's built in microphone. Yes. That's what we want. Did you think that too, Veronica, or is it just me? Um, I turned up my volume a little bit when you said that. <clears throat> um, talk a little bit more, Jed. Okay, so this is testing, testing, one, two. How's that sounding? That sounds good. Sounds good. I'm going to try to um, oh, yeah. project. My, I'm <laughs> increasing my input volume now. Okay. Yeah, that's much better. Does that sound better? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, okay. it sounds good. All right, so I'm going to get out of there. All right, so Cass, you just got to remember we got to like talk when we're talking, we got to talk into this. Okay. Not into the camera. Do you care what side you're on? Uh, no, do you care what side you're on? Come back and forth like that. Okay, I can be over here. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care where I am, even though we're like fully <laughs> changing into the sun. Well, it looks very zooey, right? <laughs> it does. It's very, you know, very we natural. Can't, we can't control the shade and the sun and everything. You know, it's. Oh, these elephants. <laughs> that's our view. Now that's elephant view. Oh my goodness. Fabulous. Oh. Lovely. And, and when we start, um, Cassie's going to actually bring them right up close here. So that's why I don't want to zoom the camera. Oh, look at that. Oh. oh my God. <laughs> oh. So that's, that's Lingili in there now. So that big butt that's pointed towards us and now that's mom. So you'll probably see Langili get out. Or maybe they'll all enjoy the mud wallow. Yeah. It's so warm favorite. today. Are they, are they cooling off in it? Is that what the mud does for yep. them? Yep. yep. It's a hot day. Cools yeah. them off and acts as a sunblock and just a lot of fun. Yeah, it is fun too. They just enjoy it. It um, feels nice on their skin and Gives them a little layer of, of sun protection. <laughs> Samba just came in and like kicked everyone out. She's like, this is my mud wallow. <laughs> Literally kicked them out. <laughs> like, find mom. I guess we can't play anymore. She's like, I need some mom time. I, I hear that, Samba. I hear that. No, nah, I don't know. <clears throat> little Penzi there. She's like running. <laughs> <laughs> I could just do this for hours. You can. You realize we do have webcams. Yeah, the yeah. zoo cam. So you, you can do it for hours, although not 
all the time is somebody controlling those cameras. So sometimes you'll get on and there won't be anything there. So that's, that's what makes these special is because, you know, we're going to get them right up close and, you know, uh, get, get them in good view for you guys. What is she, what's she doing? Is she now covering with dust on top of the mud? Yeah, so they do like to put a nice layer of dirt on their body. So it kind of seals in the moisture and um, protects their skin. So since elephants don't have fur, like a lot of other mammals, they um, protect their skin and put layers of dirt and mud and whatever they, else is comfortable. Do they get like skin cancers and stuff? Not, elephants are really not very prone to cancer, um, but they can get skin issues. So they can get some problems with um, dryness and itchiness. So oh, they're, that's they're kind of what we do. Um, Shelby. They come. Look. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh, they're getting treats. Green. Yeah. Hey, yeah. So, um, do you do you know if you have most of your people loaded in? <laughs> We're gonna wait a minute or two. We've got about half right now, and then we'll do the the official start of the show, and then turn it over to you for for all the fun. Oh my gosh. Yeah, let's give them like one more minute. <clears throat> we just watch silliness right now. Yes. Yeah. Like, oh, she's like so happy. <laughs> running around. She runs everywhere. Like when, <laughs> when I had a toddler and like he just ran everywhere. <laughs> He still runs everywhere, like, thinking about it. She's like, I, I know how to walk and use these legs. I'm going to go all out here. Yeah, she's a little silly right now. She was supposed to go with mom, and so now she's not coming. She's playing with sister, and so now they're walking mom to go get her. <laughs> go figure. Oh, my gosh. She's like, she's like, I don't want to go with you, mom. I want to play with sister. <laughs> So. All right, it's nine o'clock. I know some people are probably still gonna join us, but we'll do. Oh my! How do we like <laughs> get away from that? I'll, I'll, um, I'll turn it to us, which isn't isn't gonna be as cute for the moment, <laughs> just for the introduction, so we can get through yeah. the intro. Yeah, uh, I'm not even gonna make it through the intro. Well, I just have a few a few notes um, of of housekeeping here. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for uh, joining us bright and early this Sunday morning. Um, a huge thank you to all of our This is Tucson members um, who have supported our work over these last few months. Um, you know, it, your contributions help us continue to bring you um, relevant stories, um, stories that connect you to our Tucson community during this time when we can't all be together. Um, I'm Veronica Cruz and I'm one of the writers for This is Tucson, so just a big thank you on behalf of our entire team. Um, and one of the ways that we hope to continue to strengthen that connection of community is by bringing our members these um, virtual events, allowing us to um, learn from some of our local experts and explore some of the places that make Tucson so special to us. So a big thank you to our guests of honor today, um, Jed Dodds, who's the outreach supervisor at Reed Park Zoo, and Cassie Dodds, who is the elephant care supervisor at Reed Park Zoo. And um, the elephant herd, of course, needs no introduction, I think. Um, we are big, huge fans of this elephant herd um, at This Is Tucson. So thank you so much for bringing us this really amazing opportunity. And um, please introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit more about what we'll be doing today. All right, so thank you guys. And thank you for this opportunity to be able to talk to all of your members. Um, the Star has okay. been such a great outlet of getting information for what's going on here at Reed Park Zoo out to our amazing community. Um, so thank you to all that support the STAR as well. Uh, such a valuable institution and organization um, that's giving us uh, great information about what's going on here at Tucson. Uh, so as Veronica said, my name is Jed Dodds. And the first thing that I want to mention is that neither one of us are wearing masks. And that's because we are married. So um, we live together 
we social distance together. If that wasn't the case, then we would have masks on. We do have a mask mandate here at the Reef Park Zoo. So before we get too many questions on that, I just wanted to let you guys know that. Um, and then I'm just going to turn it over to Cassie because you're not here to listen to me. Uh, you're here to really learn about elephants. So I'm going to turn it over to Cassie and she's going to let you guys know about where we are and what we are going to see today. Hi, so I'm Cassie and I am going to tell you guys a little bit about what we're doing today. So our elephants live in a large multi-acre habitat and right now the keepers are doing a little bit of interacting with these elephants. Um, we do training with them every day. It's all voluntary training. Um, we don't go in with our elephants. We always work with them on one side of the fence and they stay on the other, but we can get a really positive interaction going with them. Um, we use rewards like treats and praise and we can ask our elephants to do different behaviors for us and get them to come up a little closer. So we have Shelby right here that's working with Samba and her newest um, little one, Penzi, who is gonna be exactly five months today, is um, having a great time in the mud. This has been the summer of mud for her. Um, every day she spends a good portion of her day just splashing around in puddles. And um, so hopefully you guys will get to see a little bit of that because she's, um, been really great and as you can see in the background we're behind the zoo public area we're in an area behind the scenes um, but you can see past the habitat over to the public side so there's guests walking around and um, we have our first visitors from after quarantine that have been able to come through in the last week to visit us and visit the elephants but, uh, this view is just like amazing. Um, I'm trying to like not lose my mind over here. I'm keeping myself on mute a bit um, for most of this. Um, but I just want to mention if anyone has any questions for Jed and Cassie, please feel free to, to leave them um, in the chat and I'll be happy to ask those on your behalf. Um, Cassie, I wondered what, what does the training entail? Like what kinds of things are you training them to do and why is that important? So as you can see, Cassie has stepped in with Penzi so I can talk a little bit about the training. As Cassie was saying, we do what's called positive reinforcement training and it's all through a protective barrier. So it's between um, us and the animal. And that's not because, uh, you know, these are you know, crazy aggressive animals. We do that with all of what we call our powerful animals. So that could be a lion, that could be our jaguar, it could be a rhino or a zebra, or of course an elephant. And what that allows us to do is a choice-based training. So the animals get to choose whether or not they want to participate. And so Samba is over here. Let me turn around. And she is participating with Shelby. But Penzi is choosing to come up and hang out with Cassie here. Now, at five months old, Penzi from pretty much day one starts training. And she starts that by observing her mom. Um, so her mom is well experienced at doing the training behaviors. They really enjoy it. They enjoy the interactions. Um, the keepers will call the elephants and they come running from the other side of the habitat. And you've got to imagine that if they didn't want to do that, um, there's no way that we're going to be able to force them to come over. Um, and so right now, Penzi's choosing. She just wants to be a little silly, which is fine. And the training really allows us to assess their entire well-being. Um, and so the elephants get to participate in their own well-being. So if we wanted to check to see how their joints were, um, we can ask them to do a behavior where they'll actually kneel down. Um, if we wanted to look inside of their mouth, we can ask them to lift their trunk back. You're gonna see Shelby ask Samba to do that right now. And we can ask her to open her mouth and we can look inside of her mouth. Uh, elephants have four teeth and there's two on the top and two on the bottom and the teeth are about the size of one of those red bricks that you would see um, in the sidewalk. So you can see her tongue right there uh, and by doing that, that allows Shelby to be able to see what's going on in there. Now nothing's going on right now, but say she was having some mouth issues. If we didn't already establish that behavior, there'd be no way for us to go in and actually see inside that mouth without her letting us. Um, just asking her to lift up a back foot. So you can see that Shelby just kind of tapped on that back foot and Samba just lifted that up. And now that gives Shelby a really good look to see, hey, is there anything going on with the foot? Is there a splinter in there? Is there um, maybe an injury that we need to treat? And after each behavior, 
you're going to see that um, the trainer's either going to do a triple pat on the elephant, um, which is a tap, tap, tap that lets them know that the behavior has been complete. Sometimes they'll blow a whistle or sometimes they'll just say good. And by doing that, then that tells the animal, hey, the behavior has been completed and now we're going to give some treats. Um, so Samba, as you can see, this is, an this is an extremely intelligent animal and able to pick up complex behavior. So you can see that we had a back, that we had a steady, and we have ears, and now we have a trunk up. So that's four to five different behaviors all linked together. Training will really depend on the animal and the individual uh, on what we're asking them to do. But this allows us to ask them to go onto a scale to get weights on them. Um, this allows us to check their feet. Um, this allows us to do blood draws, voluntary blood draws from vessels in their ears. Um, and it's extremely important because, again, you saw that stretch there. So that's testing the flexibility. Uh, we do kind of elephant yoga, if you will. So Penzi's learning. Penzi's learning those behaviors. And right now, Penzi's just learning that her trainers and her keepers are really cool. Um, they're awesome. They're a lot of fun. They give scratches on, on her booty and they get to give some good treats. Um, and then they are starting to establish that relationship. And as she gets older and she reaches some different milestones, then that training will become a little bit more complicated for her. Um, you got to imagine, think of your toddler, right? So you've got a five-year-old that's going to kindergarten. They're obviously not going to be doing what the high schooler is doing. So it's the same level of graduation that happens uh, with our elephants. And right now, Penzi's just being Penzi, and that's great. That's totally fine. She's going off to kind of see where uh, Nandi is. She's pushing logs over there. She's just able to explore her uh, environment here, her habitat. Um, she's just pretty excited to, to be out and around about right now and uh, you guys are getting a great view but also the public you can see over there uh, she's pretty excited about them since she was born during the pandemic uh, this is the first couple times that she's been able to see you know all these people which is awesome um, that all these people also get to interact and see her and we're super ecstatic that we get to do these type of events where even more people get to learn and see and get connected to uh, Penzi and to our whole herd here. Is she, uh, is she aware, Judd, like when people started to, to come and the public started to come and visit? I mean, is she aware that there's all of a sudden all like tons more people around or is that scary or, or what's that like for her? I think she did. She definitely came out and there was more people than what she's seen. Um, we tried to get her some experience with people by just bringing keep keepers and staff out there so that that first day wasn't a complete shock. I'm like, oh my gosh, who are all these things out here? Um, so we, we did try to kind of gradually get her use of that. Uh, and I think that she's just as interested in the people as the people are in her. Um, and when there's a lot of people, you can see her kind of going and throwing big ears out there um, and looking at them and, you know, kind of have wide eyes like, hey, who are you guys? What are you guys doing over here? Um, so, yeah, I don't think she's nervous about it. And, you know, she's got the power of the herd. She's got her mom. She's got her sister here and her aunts and her brother and her dad. Um, you know, so she's, she's a super confident elephants um and so i think it was a little bit of a shock but not too much yeah yeah she's really going for it it seems like she's kind of a little a bit of a show off with her ears and <laughs> running around um what's her personality like uh jed and cassie and how how is she different maybe from nandi as a as an elephant calf yeah so um i think penzi has a higher energy level she tends to be running more uh, moving quicker just having the sillies and we call them zoomies. So she gets just really torqued and starts running as fast as she can and spinning around. Um, Nandi had a little bit more of an adventure streak. She was um, challenging herself in ways that Penzi is not confident in doing. Um, she would go deep into the wallows. She was already exploring the water. Um, she was more independent. She would travel away from her mom and the rest of the herd more frequently. Um, Penzi likes to stay kind of in her safety bubble and she's a little more cautious. So that wallow is deep and she's gone in it, but she doesn't go in it that often. It's still a little bit 
deeper than she would like. So she has a lot of fun tempting herself on the edge and, um, you know, but not going in all the way. Yesterday she went in back first, so her feet were uphill and um, I have a feeling she's not gonna go back in there all the way for a couple of days. Experimenting. Um, we have a question from one of our members um, who asked, where do elephant keepers and trainers learn their craft and what type of formal or informal education do you have? And maybe Cassie, that was one thing that I was really curious about. Like, how did you come, you know, become an elephant care supervisor and um, how, how, like, what is that career path like? Yeah, so um, I, from a young age, was really interested in animals and animal behavior. So I was always working with, you know, dogs and birds and horses and things growing up. But as I got into college at U of A, I studied animal behavior. And um, I really focused it on animal learning. I did a behavior, a study, um, and got a degree in ecology and in psychology to kind of balance those two out. And um, I started interning at the zoo back in college and um, also some other various animal behavior institutions. And I ended up here uh, working with elephants just because of their behavioral complexity. I am really fascinated with their learning, their social structure and how intelligent they are, how similar they are to us. I think elephants are, um, the most amazing thing about them is just how social and how similar they are to humans and their family structure. Yeah, and so what we always tell people is if you have a passion for animals to typically get a career in working at a zoo, you need at least a four-year degree in some sort of biology, zoology. Uh, my degree is in veterinary science, a bachelor's in veterinary science. Uh, and the Reed Park Zoo has a lot of opportunities for growth, whether or not you're a teenager, whether or not you are in college, um, or even in adults, uh, we have different volunteer opportunities that you can help grow your experience if that is what you want to do. Uh, so take a look at our website, reparkzoo.org. Go to get involved. There's all of our volunteer opportunities to be a team volunteer, to be a college intern where you can actually get credit for working directly with a zookeeper, to be one of our adult docents. And that's actually where a lot of us have started. Um, I started as a college intern uh, going through my junior year at U of A and fell in love with the zoo world. And prior to that, I worked at a vet clinic for 10 years and I got hired on as a zookeeper and then moved into education uh, and now into my current role of basically telling the stories of the animals to all you guys. Um, so I get to connect what our amazing animal care staff does every single day and get to tell those stories um, to all of you, which is an amazing part. Um, I always loved being a storyteller and animals, so uh, the two really fit for me. But anyone that's interested in working with animals, please take a look at our website. Um, we wanna help you reach your goals. So uh, we all started in a similar situation and we are here to you know, create dreams for anyone else out there that's interested in doing that. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing so many of those great opportunities that exist there at the zoo. Um, we have another question. What, what are the treats in the bucket? What are, and what are some of the elephant's favorite treats in general? Yeah, so elephants are um, herbivores and they eat a pretty um, bland diet of vegetation. Um, they just eat a lot of trees and grasses and bark. Um, they have a really intense digestive tract, so they can eat um, really rough material like bark and uh, things like that. So when we work with them in training, we have a special pellet that has um, a balance of minerals and vitamins in it. And so we use a lot of that, but we also use some vegetable produce. So cucumbers, zucchini, lettuce, uh, things that are natural for them that don't have a lot of sugar. Occasionally for special treats, they do like sugary things. They like um, apples and oranges and watermelon. Um, watermelon season is one of their favorites and so is pumpkin season. So they do tend to have some favorites. They, they do like the sweet stuff, but it's not very good for them. So we save it for the, the special days. So this is Nandi that you guys are seeing now. We haven't really introduced her. So Cassie, Nandi is big sister. She is how old now? So Nandi's six. She just had a birthday in the last couple weeks. And um, she's been the baby of the Reed Park Zoo for the last many years. And she's been 
really special for the community. Um, we've been really lucky to celebrate her and have her teach people about elephant conservation. Um, we didn't know when she became a big sister how she would share the limelight. Um, she is kind of a, um, an elephant that wants what she wants and she does get a little bit fussy sometimes. So we were wondering how she would react to having a little sister. And what you just saw right there is how she reacts to her. So sometimes she gives her some lessons. She just told her right there not to take her food. But um, Penzi is completely attached to her. She is very close and bonded. Um, Nandi takes on a big role as big sister. Um, she's always watching Penzi, making sure she's safe, making sure she's doing what she should be doing, having good manners. Um, and they have been starting to play together. So that's been kind of a cool thing in the last month. They've been having more play sessions. Okay, and I don't know if you guys actually saw when Cassie said that Nandi just was teaching Penzi a little bit of a lesson on not to take her food, but there was a little bit of a behavior change there that is so um, tiny for us, but because Cassie, like, this is what she does, she's able to interpret that behavior and see what's going on because, you know, really these, the animal care staff is part of this herd. Um, they, they are part of this herd. And so understanding that elephant behavior is, is, is really, really important to know and to make sure that you're setting them up for success. So that little like bow that she did with a little head down, that was just uh, Nandi telling Penzi, hey, yeah, I've got food right here. It's not for you. I know you want to play right now, but give me a moment. Um, and it's so subtle, but it's, again, that elephant communication, uh, which is just extraordinary to be able to watch. And Cassie, that's really, we get to see that because we have a family herd here. So we've seen Samba, Penzi, Nandi. We have a new elephant that just walked into our screen. Who is this? So this is Lingili. Um, she's the aunt of our herd. Um, we, in science, call her an Allo mother. So elephants are matriarchal societies, and the females spend their lives together. Um, the mothers, daughters, aunts, grandmothers, um, generation after generation, they'll stay together and teach each other, kind of like culture, where the good water is, where the food is over times of drought. Um, the females take on a big role in watching each other's offspring, and um, it's really important role for Lingili. Um, she's low ranking, so she's not as dominant as Samba, but she does spend a lot of time watching after the kids and making sure that they're in line and that they're safe. And um, she takes that as a, a big responsibility upon herself to keep eyes on them and make sure that they're doing well. And then let's talk, uh, Veronica, maybe about weights, because I know everybody is interested about yes. how much does everyone weigh, uh, which is cool because these guys are the largest land animals on the planet. Um, and so weights are pretty extreme when you're talking elephants. Uh, Cassie, let's, let's start out with Penzi. How much was she uh, when she was born? Okay, so Penzi was a gigantic calf. Um, she was one of the biggest of the whole herd that she comes from, and she was 295 pounds, and um, that's a pretty significant size for a baby elephant, but um, since then, she's gone through a lot of growth, and she's doubled in size in the last month, and now she's 610 pounds today. So we do weigh her every day. She's gaining about three, two to four pounds every day, unless she's going through some sort of growth spurt. Um, sometimes she'll taper for a day or two, but we're weighing her every day, making sure that everything's healthy and that she's putting on the pounds. Okay, and so how about, uh, how about Nandi? How much was Nandi when, since Penzi was 295, how much was Nandi when she was born? So Nandi was um, 245, and she also was a pretty big calf, um, comparatively. She, um, right now is about 3,500 3, pounds. So she's, um, you know, definitely gotten a lot bigger in her six years and um, she can get up to probably 7,000, 7,500 pounds um, as she grows through her life. Right now, Samba, her mom, who's still working off some pregnancy weight, um, we got her at 7,500 on the scale today. So, um, you know, there's a large range in the females. And from Penzi, who is the smallest, to Mabu, who is the father here, to our largest, how much is Mabu weighing in at? So um, Mabu, the, the bull of our herd, he is um, a very large bull. He's probably the largest animal in Arizona. Um, he's 13,500 pounds. And um, he does fluctuate a couple pound, hundred pounds from month to month, but um, that's kind of where he's hanging out right now. Okay, and Cassie's saying fluctuates a couple hundred pounds month to month. Um, let's talk about how much these guys eat in a day. So how much would Mabu eat in a day? 
So elephants can eat a couple hundred pounds of food every day. So that's about how much we give them. Um, they get um, a certain amount of measured out pellet, hay, grasses, but the biggest, most important part of their diet is tree trimmings. So the hard foliage from the, the plants is the very healthiest thing for them. We spend a lot of time cultivating, growing plants, um, working with landscapers to make sure that they're getting a lot of that fiber and um, healthy, non-toxic plants. Okay, so they can eat a couple hundred pounds a day. They can also poop a couple hundred pounds a day. So Mabu is probably urinating and defecating around 100 to 150 pounds. So these guys can fluctuate hundreds of pounds every day, depending on when you have fed them and when they've gone to the bathroom. All right, so 13,500 pounds, that could go up or down a couple hundred pounds just depending on the day. So, um, you know, there's a lot of food that goes on and there's also a lot of poop that goes on. And all that poop is really good nutrients where we work with a composting organization that takes all of our herbivore feces and composts that into fertilizer that we get to sell to local farmers here in our community, which then help to regrow trees. So we have this positive feedback circle of a lot of those tree trimmings that are being cut down. They come to the zoo for the elephants to eat, they poop it out, and then it gets recycled into fertilizer to grow more trees. Um, so, you know, anytime we have an opportunity to try to uh, save, recycle, reuse, uh, we are going to do that here at the zoo. And elephants, they're a great example of that. Uh, Veronica, do we have some other questions we might be able to answer? Um, and uh, I don't have any in the chat right now, but I was wondering, one thing that I thought was really interesting, because I went to Nandi's sixth birthday party last weekend or a couple weekends ago, and um, I didn't realize that she had just weaned shortly before um, Penzi was born. And so she's been nursing for six years, correct? Give yeah, or take. Yeah. Yeah, um, she was five when Penzi was born, and she nursed until just a little after she turned five. A lot of times mother elephants will nurse until they have another calf on the way. Um, it's just a matter of it's the best nutrients, and if they can do it a little bit longer, they will. A lot of times elephant calves are spaced out three to four years apart, so Londi got lucky with that five-year window. She got a little bit more out of it. And we'll also, uh, we see this in the wild as well. Um, one of the things that we are doing here at Reed Park Zoo, we are uh, first and foremost an education center where we get to bring people in to learn about these amazing animals. I mean, that's what we're doing right now. I mean, we are getting you up close in a way that is very different than if you were to read it in a book or maybe see it on TV. Hopefully this type of interaction has a little bit more of a connection to it. And that's where the zoo really falls is being able to teach people through connecting with our wildlife because unfortunately, a lot of our wildlife is in trouble. Uh, elephants are considered a threatened or an endangered animal, an endangered species. And by doing that, that means that their numbers have decreased to a point where we need to really be careful about what's going on. Um, so Cassie, one of the big problems is uh, habitat loss for elephants, but another one is still poaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so elephants are facing a lot of problems in the wild. Um, they are losing a lot of habitat. In Africa, a lot of those areas that they live in are getting developed into farms as the population of human cultivation in crows, they're losing a lot of space. But in addition to that, a lot of people are funding a lot of their operations through ivory, and it's really detrimental for the elephants. Um, we are losing close to 100 elephants every day from the ivory poaching. It's something that we've been working really hard on in the last five years, and we're starting to get some some really good impacts in certain populations. So we're seeing a lot of great research and conservation happening and some of it we're actually involved in. Yeah, and I'm just gonna reiterate 100 elephants a day, 35,000 elephants a year are lost due to the ivory trade. There's about 400,000 to 500,000 elephants on the continent of Africa. Um, if we extrapolate that out, 35,000 every year, within 15 years, we can lose the largest land animal on our planet. Uh, and so what can we do? You know, that's always the question everyone asks. You know, we're not in Africa. We don't live with elephants. We're not in East Africa, South Africa. You know, what, what can we do to help save a animals? Uh, well, the, the best thing that you can do is what you're doing right now. Uh, you are on learning. You are on supporting an organization 
that is protecting wild animals in wild places. So Reed Park Zoo does conservation work globally, meaning that we are working with conservationists that are on the ground, scientists that are on the ground in the native habitats of that species, and they are learning what the problems are. Because we can't protect something until we learn what the problem is first. So with elephants, we know we're dealing with a poaching problem. We're dealing with habitat fragmentation, where their habitats are being cut off due to their migration corridors being cut off by roads or buildings or growth. And so now what can we do? So we've been working with Dr. Charles Foley, who's a conservationist in Tanzania in East Africa. He's in the northern part of East Africa in the Tarangiri National Park. And the Tarangiri National Park is a critical migration corridor for over 80,000 animals that call the Tarangiri River a source of life during the drought season. So just like here we have some sort of seasons, right? And it is a desert, and so not a lot of rainfall happens there. During the rainy season, all those animals in the Tarangiri National Park, they go out through these migration corridors to these other places. Then once the rains are dried up, and there's, there's no more water outside, they all come in because the Tarangiri River is one of the only annual water sources in that area. So they need those migration corridors to come in and out of that park. What Dr. Foley has been doing over the last 35 years is learning the problem and then protecting it. Reed Park Zoo has been involved with that project for over 15 years. And now he is proud to say that over a million acres of habitat has been protected, not only in the national park, but also the surrounding areas. So all those migration corridors are now protected. And Tarangiri National Park is one of the places that you can go to East Africa where we actually see an increase in the elephant population. When he first started his project over 35 years ago, he had only about 1,200 elephants that were calling that area home. He now has over 4,000 elephants that are calling that area home. It's one of the best places to go and see large herds of elephants that are calm and just in a, in a great social environment. And that's due to conservation. And that conservation funding is due to zoological facilities that are funding that operation. And we have that because of you. So you guys are a direct connection into the solution of saving animals in wild places, which is absolutely amazing. So that's only one of the conservation projects that we we're doing. And we're so proud of that project. It's one of the longest standing the Reed Park Zoo has been involved with. And of course the elephant herd here is, is such an iconic piece of what Reed Park Zoo is now. Um, it's so important for us to actually have action with this herd. So each one of our elephants here, they represent those elephants in the wild. Uh, Penzi being born here, celebrating a birthday here. Uh, we celebrate all those elephants and we give hope to all those elephants that they get to celebrate their next birthday. Um, and we all get to be a part of that. So again, thank you guys that are on right now. Thank you guys for that are talking to people out there um, because you guys are part of the solution of saving this problem and we can do it. I mean, look at Tarangiri National Park. It is a perfect example of what conservation does, how it works and how it can save animals. So um, it's, it's such a great tie in to really the purpose of what we're doing here um, to protecting those wild animals. So thank you guys for that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, um, you know, kind of taking us giving us a look at the bigger picture and how, um, you know, it's not just, these are cute animals that we are fortunate to get to see, but there is a, a bigger goal with these efforts. Um, I did share a link in the chat to, um, you have a really great page on the Reed Park Zoo website, um, all about the conservation work um, that you do. And that has links to the Tarangiri Elephant Project. Um, and to a couple of the, the organizations um, that you all help support and that are connected to the zoo. So definitely go there and learn more information. Um, it's a really great resource to, to learn about some of that work. Um, we do have a couple of other questions from the chat. Um, some, some more elephant stats, if you okay. will. Um, so questions about age. At what age are elephants considered adults? And then how old can elephants get? So what's kind of the, the average lifespan? Yeah, so um, elephants, the males don't have quite as long of a lifespan as the females. They end up with a little more wear and tear on their bodies. So they can live um, 
up to their 50s, but it's more common for the males to live closer to 30. The females, um, they, can, they have been seen to live up into their 50s as well, but their average is more in the mid 40s. So um, in zoos, we're doing a lot of research and we've been, every decade, every year, we get a whole bunch more conservation research knowledge and are able to improve their habitats and their health care. So elephants are living longer and longer in zoos. In the wild, um, we still have some issues out there with um, loss of habitat and things like that. So, um, you know, having elephants live into their mid 40s is pretty average, but um, we'd like to be seeing them living longer than that. Um, how old are the, the older elephants that are part of this herd? We know Nandi is six, we know Penzi is five months. Um, what are the ages of the other elephants? Kathy? Yeah, so the other um, adults, so we have um, the mom of the herd, Samba, she's 30. And then um, the male, Mabu, he's also 30. They came in um, together from San Diego and they were, they were the same age. Linkyule, we think, is a year younger, so she's probably 29. Um, the aunt of the herd that you saw earlier. We also have another young male, and he is nine years old. Um, so that's kind of an adolescent age. Um, he does spend a lot of time with the family group, but his favorite one to hang out with right now is his father. Um, male elephants, once they reach reproductive maturity, they do tend to travel away from the female herds. They have a long childhood. They'll stay with their families till between when they're anywhere from seven to 13, depending on the herd social structure, but they do tend to wander off and join other groups of males. They call them bachelor herds. And um, they spend a lot of their time sparring and wrestling and trying to become the most dominant. So they'll live in large groups of males, sometimes even up to a hundred have been seen. But um, once they get really big like Mabu, they tend to escort female breeding groups. So once they're dominant enough to claim um, that dominant position around the females, they will do um, a lot of time with female herds again. Um, someone asked a question um, that I think definitely ties into this. Um, they asked if Penzi were a male, how long uh, would they stay with the female herd, females, and then where would they go after? But I think you can speak to Sun Tzu, um, cause he's, nine now and so how long do you expect him to stay with this herd and what are kind of the plans once it's kind of evaluating um as a big picture we have a species survival plan so we'll make decisions based on um what the rest of the population in zoos is doing if there's a herd that has some young males that needs a bachelor herd we would consider that at the right time at this time in his life he's um He's integrating well with the herd and he's really learning a lot from Mabu, his father. So it's a really important time in his life where he is learning a lot of bull behavior. And um, so we would really want to encourage that until there's another better fit for him as if he's going to be with a bull herd or when he's old enough, potentially a breeding herd one day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to, to zoom in here because uh, they're a little bit further away. Let's see, we have another question about how do you transport an elephant? So Cassie, this, the um, Mabu and Lingile and Samba, they came from San Diego how many years ago? So they came from San Diego in 2012. Um, transporting an elephant is, um, it's a really impressive process and we want to do it as stress-free as possible. Um, so it generally involves them getting trained to go in a large crate. So we have large crates that are really strong and durable that can be loaded on semi-trucks. But the biggest, most important part of that is getting them comfortable in those crates. So when we've done crate training and been involved with moving elephants around, um, we have spent a lot of time training them to go into those crates and be comfortable standing in there, getting a lot of nice treats and reinforcement and food in those spaces so that when it does t come time for them to have to travel, um, it's a really comfortable space for them. Lots of preparation. Oh my goodness. Getting yeah, all those snacks. Wrong <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's also not cheap. There's a cost that's involved. Um, and, you know, luckily we have such great partners like the San Diego Zoo uh, Global where these elephants have come from. So the adult elephants are from the San Diego Safari Park. 
Um, and uh, so we have a great partnership with them. Um, I wondered, so we had talked a little bit about this, I think before a lot of people um, joined the meeting. So maybe you could go back and talk a little bit about um, just the importance of the mud wallows and what, they, what they're actually doing when they're splashing around in there. It's not just having fun, there's actually um, a practical purpose too. Yeah, so um, just to kind of go over elephant skin, um, they have a really thick skin, but it's very sensitive. They have a lot of little hairs on there. Um, since elephants don't have fur, they, um, their skin is a little vulnerable. So it's a big part of their um, care to make sure that their skin is moisturized, it's cooled down, it's not getting sunburned. So elephants spend a lot of time using mud, dirt, sand, to manicure their skin and get nice layers of mud on there. Um, it also is a great way to cool down. If, if it's really hot, which it is here, and it is also where they come from, they're gonna take mud and cool mud and throw it on their bodies. You can see Nandi has some bits of mud on her leftover from her last mud wallow. And those little spots will keep her body cooled down, especially on the ears. Those giant ears that they have pass a lot of air. She can flap those ears just like you would a fan or a piece of paper and it blows ears across her neck, which is the spot that she really needs to cool down. Um, in addition to that, sometimes elephants will take the cool mud or cool water and splash it behind their ears. And then when they flap their ears, it cools them down instantly. So elephants are really great at doing the thermoregulating. It's kind of similar to a swamp cooler, just pushing cool wetness across their body with their fans. <laughs> Those are some giant fans there. <laughs> um, someone asks um, how they stand the triple digit heat and do they sleep outdoors or do they have a place to go at night? We, we did touch on that. I did want to know too, do elephants sleep standing up or do they lay down or like what is that like? Yeah, so they do both. Um, most elephants will lay down for about three to four hours a night. They'll also doze standing. Um, most of the younger elephants spend more time laying down flat and where the bigger elephants spend a little bit more time standing while they doze. Kenzie's actually just in the last month learning how to sleep standing up. So we'll see her kind of standing there trying to bl block her legs and take little naps from time to time. But um, if she's really tired, she'll just lay down flat. <laughs> oh my gosh. But um, you asked about cooling down in the triple digits. Um, you know, our elephants have done really well this summer. This summer has been brutal on us keepers, but um, our elephants, they have an air conditioned barn. So um, depending on how they're, they're reacting to the heat, we can bring them in and cool them down. Um, it doesn't really bother them too much once it get, until it gets over 105. Um, once it's that hot, we usually always give them access to cool down and come into the barn and um, make sure that there's a lot of mud wallows and places for them to cool off. Are they pretty active um, most of the day or do they kind of, you know, retreat maybe to that air-conditioned barn during the hotter parts of the day or what can we expect if we head to the that, zoo during this time? Yeah, I think usually um, they're a little bit more active in the mornings when they first come out. Um, but then they cycle through. They'll go into feeding mode and then they'll go into resting mode. And then once it gets hot, they might go back into wallowing, which will turn into activity and fun again. So they kind of don't have an exact pattern, but you will sometimes catch them when you come here just resting because um, this is a really active social herd and they do have times where they're really active and then they do have times where they just want to kind of chill and stay cool. We have another a member question. Um, how soon after giving birth do they breed and do they come into heat? So generally it's not till after a year. Um, Samba having just had a calf isn't likely to be um, cycling again for probably another like 10 to 12 months again. Um, but we're watching their hormones. We do urinalysis. So we can um, collect that off of the floor in certain areas and run that to San Diego and get assessments on how their hormones are looking. Do you expect that she will have another calf? I know it's pretty early, but is she of age to have another calf? Yeah, Maybe so, in a few years? Yeah, yeah so females um, that have had calves can continue to have calves into their 40s. Um, the thing that we want to be aware of is the genetic pool. We want to make sure that 
everyone has the right level of genetic diversity and um, we'll, we won't make that decision by ourselves. We'll discuss that with the elephant taxonomic group to make sure that you know, we're doing the best that we can to breed the elephants that really need to be breed to have offspring and contribute to the population. But um, it's kind of a decision we'll keep, keep assessing as we go forward and over the next year. What are some, um, what are some kind of big milestones that have happened in the first five months that Penzi, Penzi's been around? I know that she recently had her first kind of mud wallow and you all are doing an amazing job of documenting um, so many of these things on the zoo's blog. So that's a great place to, to go kind of throughout the day and learn more um, about what, what she's doing. But Cassie, what are some kind of big things that you've seen her do in the last five months? Yeah, so um, so just this month, I'll start with this month. Um, so she's been getting braver in the wallows, which is a big deal. She doubled her weight, which is makes us incredibly happy. Um, she did her first trumpet that we heard. Um, she was excited and she blew out a little baby elephant trumpet, which was the cutest thing I've ever heard. Um, she does have a large vocal range and elephants do communicate vocally, but that was a sound that is kind of special. Um, it's the, the typical trumpet sound. Um, going back, she's really also met Milestone socially. So she's learning to travel away from her mom and spend time with the other herd members. Um, she also is digestively, um, that's one of the things we're the most excited about. She's starting to eat um, large amounts of food and she's eating hay right now. Um, this week especially, there was a tipping point where she just started shoving hay in her mouth and eating it as fast as she could. And so she's ready to go right now as far as food and she's putting a lot of different things in her mouth and um, doing really appropriate elephant things. Um, when she was really young, she had um, a little bout of an infection and that got her um, digestive tract out of whack. So she had a couple times where she had diarrhea and we were always really watching it. So we spent a lot of time watching her digestive tract, making sure it's healthy and that she's putting the appropriate things in there. And so that's one of the things that as elephant care staff that we are obsessed with, we just really want to make sure that her digestive tract is really strong and healthy. Oh my goodness. Oh, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, she, she went through a little bout where she thought it was fun to eat things like sand and, you know, we've been making sure we're giving her a lot of opportunities to eat really appropriate things. And um, she's meeting that milestone wonderfully in the last week. I have a puppy that is about the same age as Penzi, and it's the same thing. There's just like, no, we can't eat that thing. That is yeah. not an edible thing. That is good yeah. for you. <laughs> a lot of similarities there. Do we have any other questions from our members? Um, any burning questions? Make sure you get those in. Oh my goodness. So are they just enjoying the shade right now, Cassie? Is that why they're kind of gravitating toward that area? Yeah, they, they're just resting. So Langeli just sometimes likes to go over and spend time with the two youngsters. So right now she's just kind of hanging with them and um, they're trying to decide if they want to play or go eat. It looks like they're kind of in limbo right now. They had a pretty busy morning playing in the mud. So I think that they might be in foraging mode and they're going to go look around for some food. But sometimes they do just come and stand close to each other. It's a social behavior for them to stand. Um, next to each other within a couple feet.